Welcome to the Navit Gaming Podcast, where it is our mission to explore the business and future of video games. We bring together the industry's brightest builders, investors, and thinkers to keep a pulse on current events, dissect emerging trends and games, share lessons learned, and have a great time. This podcast is also part of Novik's growing ecosystem, which ranges from free and premium research to consulting and advisory services. For more information, visit www.novik.co. Now, let's jump into the episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Novik Roundtable. I'm your host, Devin Becker, and today we got some great panelists. Uh, as I said before, the ever lively Aaron Bush, co-founder here at Novik, We've got the uh, the familiar Anil Dasgupta here from First Light Games, and then uh, first time for me, Jonathan Ast- Anastas, uh, CEO of Clash TV. Yep. Uh, how are you guys doing today? Doing great. Glad I can be here with the familiar Anil. <laughs> Never know. <laughs> that when, my what, term now. Thank you. Everyone's gotta get <laughs> the an titles are gonna be. That's how it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'll uh, take it. Could be Jonathan. better. Could be worse. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, happy to be here. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, I guess before cool. we jump in, Jonathan, I've, I'm even just curious for you. How have your your first days as CEO of Clash TV been going for you? Curious to get an update. <laughs> sure. So, you know, early stage company, first time CEO. I'm trying to keep it all consuming. But from being all consuming, you can very easily take up every moment of my of my day, uh, you know, awake or asleep. I, I think the lesson I'm trying to learn that's probably familiar to any startup executive is like ruthless uh, focus on taking anything extraneous out of your schedule, right? And trying to only focus on the things that move the levers the most. But I've uh, seen a lot of traction in the first 45 days. Lots of big news to come. I'll try to keep this from being a commercial for Clash TV. But uh, we've been working on some deals that we'll be uh, happy to announce in the future, some in the genre of gaming. So, Sweet. Perfect. That's exciting. We'll have to have to time your uh, your next appearance for when you've got an announcement, right? When you get when you're when you exactly. got your book to talk about and everything. <laughs> exactly. Cool. Well, uh, we actually managed to get a letter in the uh, well, a letter from from the last mailbag uh, ask, and uh, I believe the the email was podcast novic.co, right, Aaron? For the mailbag. Yep, podcast at novic.co. You you think we? You have any comments on anything we say? Any questions you want to throw at us? If you think we got something horribly right or wrong, um, let us know. We want to showcase your insights and thoughts um, too as we you know grow out this great community that we have. So glad we got um, got the mailbag flowing a bit. Let's let's keep it rolling. Yeah, we uh, we actually did get this one as as feedback on a topic, which I thought was great. You know, get the keep the conversation rolling from that previous episode. So I'm going to read it out. It's a little bit of a long one, uh, but I'll, I'll, I figure it's worth the, you know giving them the whole thing here. Uh, so I'll go ahead and read that out now. They got the the one thing I felt the crew forgot to hit on when discussing Monster Hunter is the IP genre fit, and this was referring to the Monster Hunter uh, Niantic game. They said they're skeptical of the title's success, but I think there's more nuance. One of the big reasons Pokemon Go worked for Niantic, apart from a huge IP, is the IP genre fit. Pokemon is about collecting Pokemons around the world, which fits perfectly to the AR gameplay Niantic made. Harry Potter doesn't share a similar IP genre fit, and neither does NBA All-Star. Monster Hunter, on the other hand, is all about hunting and capturing monsters in a large world, so IP genre fit is huge. But the issue is that the IP is only famous in Japan. So even if Niantic does not veer too much away from Pokemon Go style gameplay, Monster Hunter could actually be a great fit for the genre. But just that it might only see massive success in Japan and it'll be up to Niantic to figure out how to maximize global success, if that's their goal. Anyway, my question to the group, uh, when they said they don't think the game will be a success, did they consider IP genre fit? And do they think it won't be a success in all markets, including Japan? It's a good question. I think I think I was on that episode and I have thoughts, but maybe Anil or Jonathan, since this would be your first time chiming in, I'm curious if either of you have any thoughts on this one. Um, I think it's a great question. Great comments from whoever sent this in. I mean, I, I would generally agree with a lot of they say. I mean, my opinion is, so spoilers, I sort of did work off on an old, old Monster Hunters that on a PSP. So that's showing my age, to be honest with you. Um, and one of the big things, in Japan, what was really crazy about that game is it sort of single-handedly made the PSP a relevant device. So you used to have Monster Hunter cafes and people would go there and as a social thing, play the game all together and you'd get huge queues and it did amazing. 
And Capcom spent many, many years trying to get that game to be successful in the West. And they did finally do it now with the, you know, the, the new ones that come out on, on PlayStation and things like that. And that is quite interesting. I think there's a lot to be said there. I think, you know, on paper, it sounds like a great fit, right? It's a game that's even proven itself on mobile, albeit in one territory. Um, you know, you hunt monsters, that worked with Pokemon Go, will it work this way? But I don't know about for, for you guys, but I remember when Pokemon Go really exploded onto the scene. I think that sort of phenomenal sort of everyone knew it, everyone grew up with it. Now you can fulfill that fantasy that you had as a kid stroke teenager, but you're an adult with real money and can spend something was really what powered it into the stratosphere. But I do remember seeing surreal things like being in um, St. James's Park in London and hearing, seeing one person go, a Charizard's over there and seeing like a hundred grown adults have run over to it. And I was like, wow games is happening that that was one of those like feel good moments i think i don't think monster hunter is, is anywhere near the same level of ip to get there so it's an interesting choice to make for a game um I, I, in my opinion, I don't really think the game will be too successful. Perhaps they will be successful in Asia. I think in Japan especially, it, it could blow up because, um, yeah, it's huge like IP over there and they're really well suited. So a bit of a rambling thoughts there, but I, I think the writers <laughs> spot on with their, their comments, I have to say. Just to, just to give us a little bit of credit from the last episode, I think we did say at least that out of all of the, the new lineup, of all the games in the new lineup for Niantic, Monster Hunter... Uh, is probably the one to keep an eye on the most because of the IP genre fit. Um, and so there, I think, you know, we're still curious, if not just, you know, a bit skeptical as Anil is also laying out. And I think it's just going to be hard to make any kind of comparison to Pokemon Go. So I think you just kind of have to, to pause there because that is just like, you know, on a complete end of the spectrum in terms of what it was able to accomplish as a phenomenon. But um, it's lightning in a bottle, right? I don't think you'll ever see that again with a game like that. I, unless there's a Pokemon Go 2, but that's probably the only way you pull it off. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, between the brand not being nearly as big, between it, it is probably going to be more regional focused. And, you know, the core audience is more hardcore than, than Pokemon 2. And that's going to be harder to translate. I mean, to Mobile 1, but even just specifically to an AR location-based game. Um, too. And and frankly, it's fair to be skeptical because nothing else has worked besides Pokemon Go to date. And so you kind of need to, in some sense, see it before you believe it, uh, but at least at least for me, um, when it comes to these types of games. And of course, it's not even really a dig against Monster, Monster Hunter as it is just like the hardware isn't ready to support more variety in this type of game. And even with Pokemon Go, a lot of people turn the AR off. And so for this kind of game to really scale up and be more interesting ar around the world and be something novel, I think we just have to give it some time for the, the hardware to catch up to, the, to the, the dreams and the ambitions behind what these projects can, can be. So maybe, maybe the next version of Monster Hunter and you know, AR location-based game, you know, 10 years from now or something, that could be a lot more interesting than what they would spin up this year so hopefully that provides some context but it was a great great question um to throw out and again podcast at novic.co hit us up yeah man let's get it rolling obviously uh we may have guests change up so it, you know it may not necessarily be the same people answering it so keep that in mind when you write it but we definitely uh will we'll be able to speak on it regardless so uh really appreciate uh, the especially the early adopter there maybe we, we can give them some kind of nft badge for that or something <laughs> Yeah, but uh, we definitely appreciate it. I was just thinking as well, like um, you know, maybe uh, NBA, white list uh, allowed. <laughs> <laughs> maybe uh, NBA All Star would have been a better fit since it was about capturing basketball players. If they just made it Space Jam themed, <laughs> it would have made a lot more sense. Yeah, but uh, let's get into a, a bunch of topics here because we have a lot for today. A lot of updates uh, on all kinds of different topics, starting with uh, some. Updates around Microsoft's acquisition in cloud gaming, as we like to continue to talk about, because there's always drama there. Uh, some Apple lawsuit results, which uh, are always a long time coming, just because of the legal system. And then uh, some some big topic, big broad one on uh, just the cost of games, just going nuts here, uh, which is kind of, I guess, in, in a way related to the first two. So uh, let's dig into uh, Microsoft, though, and their progress or not with uh, acquisitions. 
Here we go again. So I'm tired of talking <laughs> about this deal. And I'm sure most people who have been listening to this podcast are tired of hearing me talk about this deal, too. So I'll uh, I'll try to try to keep it moving. and We can pass it around a bit. But my really my my rant for today is that, um, you know, the CMA, the UK's regulatory body blocked the deal on the grounds that it may harm competition in the nascent UK cloud gaming market. They even took to social media with all sorts of branded graphics and emoji, you know, covered tweets and messages to explain their their so-called rationale um, for this decision. So, you know, of course, most of you have probably been listening for the podcast long enough to know that at least I think that this is pretty absurd. Um, I'm not sure if this deal as a whole even makes perfect sense or if it'll work out or be perfectly executed, even if it were allowed to go through. But I do know that there really is no antitrust case here. And hinging the deal's viability on the UK's cloud gaming market um, is a total clown move. And whoever is running the CMA either still doesn't understand this market, despite all the months of conversation and research that they've had, um, they're blind or just don't care about the concessions being made here. And I'll let Jonathan talk about that a little bit more in, in a minute. Um, or they just don't care. And it's uh, like a political decisions um, kind of being made in, in bad faith in some ways. So it's hard to say from the outside, but either way, um, it doesn't feel right to me, at least. So, of course, with, with this block happening, it's technically not the end. Microsoft will appeal the decision. It'll go to UK courts. Um, you know, however, the history of such decisions getting repealed in those courts, um, as I understand, is not necessarily encouraging <laughs> for those trying to, um, you know, repeal these decisions and go against the the government um, and the the rulings that have been made. But either way, it's just going to drag the saga out further, and these companies will almost certainly at this point, miss the summer 2023 deadline that they were aiming for, which of course was still a year and a half after the um, the deal was announced in the first place. So what's next? One is the fun court action to look forward to. Um, second is that maybe they'll try to, to carve out some specific deal for how these combined companies can operate in the UK. Although that's really probably a, a complicated path to go down that will just be difficult to manage. Um, and then, um, you know, uh, I mean, third is just the kind of the bigger picture that, uh, you know, just kind of reflecting on this, if regulators are going to block this deal out of all deals and, you know, similar regulators also took issue against like Meta acquiring like a VR fitness app too, for example. So, um, but what this is really doing is sending a signal to the rest of big tech in particular that, hey, we don't like big companies that are getting bigger through acquisitions um, without regard for the, the nuance of it. And I think it could just freeze up the M&A market for big tech even more than it, than it has been over the past few years. Um, so it's a weird time. Um, and I, I kind of just want to, my final sentence here, just to clarify, is that I don't hate regulators. I think regulations are important. It's just that um, whatever is going on here, I, I guess I would say it like I don't like clowns. And <laughs> I feel like regulators are acting <laughs> like clowns right now, at least with regards to this deal. Um, so anyways, I'll, I'll end my, my, my rant right there. Um, but anyways, I'll hand it over to you, Jonathan. I'm curious if you want to add anything else or maybe even just add some details from the standpoint of what Microsoft is doing on the cloud front and how that connects to these decisions being made. Sure. I have very little to add to your excellent rant. I, there's a little bit of color that's worth noting, which is in part of the response, Bobby Kotick called out that potentially the CMA and the FTC met semi-secretly in Washington. Well, that in and of itself is not technically illegal. Bobby made the point that, you know, with ongoing court cases involving the FTC, that actually might be potentially not kosher. But clearly, you know, the, the other piece I would add to your rant is, sorry, UK and the EU, this is why you can't have nice things. This is why you can't have trillion dollar companies. This is why you can't have a disproportionate number of unicorns. Like, you know, we live in a global economy. 
money will flow, business will flow, jobs to flow will flow to territories that are friendly to such things. And and I think this is a a real shame. Before I kind of talk about Microsoft's response, um, Anil, do you have any sort of specific additions you'd like to make? I, I, I saw some vigorous head nodding to Aaron's rant. That's our UK well, representative. Yes. Yeah, yeah. There was one very interesting thing. I don't know if you caught wind of it. So in the UK, someone from Microsoft came out and made a statement where they basically said, oh, it seems like Britain isn't the place for big tech anymore. And there are better opportunities in mainland Europe. So I found that really interesting. That was like really quite a pissy thing to say. And I think, you know, you mentioned in your point, is it a political move? It speaks volumes that 100% is a political move. Because as you say, the cloud gaming market in the UK, I mean, I'm laughing as I'm saying it, there is no cloud gaming market in the UK. There's no cloud gaming market, period, right? It's all completely trumped up and did it. I mean, I have to say, I'm not necessarily a- against the move. I can of understand why, especially if you give the size of the, the acquisition compared to any other gaming acquisition, it's on a completely different planet. But the reason given is just sort of so poor. Um, and I actually have a feeling, though, that for that reason, they will not appeal it because I kind of think I, I actually didn't know about that, this sort of secret meeting behind closed doors. That's very interesting to, to hear. That's a rumor. I could definitely believe it. But it definitely, I have to say that the, the feeling in over here was they thought that maybe Sony had gone to the UK government and sort of kind of pandered towards them. But they don't really strike me as sort of people that would do that in this country per se with enough clout anyway, not as certainly as much as clout as Microsoft have. But um, yeah, I just wanted to say that that's very interesting that they would resort to sort of such a thing to sort of like say, oh, we're going to move our sort of offices to somewhere else. And um, yeah, the drama just keeps going on and on. Speaking about the cloud focus, which, you know, as everybody's sort of eye rolling, right? Like Google walked away from this business, like the cloud market, oh, like, you know, needs to be protected. Microsoft, uh, you know, to her credit here, continues to double down. You know, know, the immediate follow on to this deal was Microsoft signing a 10 year deal with NWARE, which is about the fifth or sixth global cloud computing deal they've done, you know, in a recent period, sort of promising full access to their games, which then would mean Activision's games if the merger goes through to anywhere in there, I believe 10 million customers or subscribers for 10 years. So if we're trying to make a case that we're building a closed ecosystem and it's not going to be fair play and these games are going to be behind our secret little walled garden, you know, here's another big giant F you to sort of say like, what the heck are you talking about here? So, you know, I, I think you'll continue to see Microsoft make strategic moves like this to kind of show the availability and openness of their IP. But again, I think it's all window dressing because nobody's making money off cloud computing right now. Do you think the deal is dead? I don't, actually. Um, You know, I think I can't speak to UK court jurisdictions and, and you referenced the very low, you know, sort of win rate or overturn rate. If we move back to the US side of this deal... The current FTC has a very poor track record in their blockage of these things because of their overstep. You know, I, I think Meta's handed them a couple of significant losses. They've lost on other grounds. So, you know, again, I, I am no expert on the on the UK, you know, antitrust business landscape. When I look at the US side, I, I see Microsoft and Activision prevailing, and, and they're acting in a manner of which you would win. They are not backing down. They are doubling down. And at least on the U.S. side, I I predict victory and I predict the deal closes. Do you guys think there's any chance that Sony could be involved because of the um, – they've been making some moves around cloud stuff recently, right? Like we talked about that in a previous episode that they had some previous cloud people. They were starting to do some hiring around it. Like they obviously have some level of cloud ambition, which, you know, is more their kind of play anywhere sort of thing from uh, PlayStation. But do you think then – like obviously Sony's been – you know, big player in constantly trying to kick Microsoft's legs out from under them in this deal. And uh, as you said, Anil, like maybe they're not a big player with a big influence in the UK, but do you still think that they, they might have been involved in helping f- like foment this excuse for this? Oh, 100%. 100% they would have been. Really, you, know, you know, it'd be stupid for them not to do it. Um, I just don't think that they would have the clout required to pull it off completely by themselves. Whereas if it was, let's say, a, a Google, a Meta, an Amazon, you know, one of the big five, 
then they would. Then I would totally believe it. I just don't see Sony quite on that tier. I see them as being the tier below, which is why they kind of done that. I, I do also think with the deal specifically, it's kind of convenient that like, oh, so a, a big tier one country has disapproved the deal, but it's not the US. So, you know, I, well, you know, then we, we can't really approve it. If it's not, you know, the deal is kind of a waste of time. It just seems like rather like, you know, very nicely wrapped up in a bow in terms of like not having to make the big decision where it really matters, but actually making a decision elsewhere. And as we know, you know, the UK is, you know, sometimes described as like, you know, the the airport for US anyway into Europe, but in terms of where you do your business. So um, and I would be curious to know who, what did it, you know, behind the scenes? Was it, you know, maybe even the Fed or, the, or something like that? I mean, they would definitely have, you know, made their feelings known, but... I, I can't really think of too many instances in this country where Sony has, for example, leaned on the government hard enough to get a decision go their way. That is quite common done over here, but not really by tech or, or companies like that. So that's why I don't think they were responsible here. But who knows? It's, it's all speculation on my behalf. Sorry, my, my, my final question about this sort of related to like whether the deal closes um, is I'm just wondering like if the FTC says yes if the EU says yes but the UK still is stubborn and saying no what happens does that break the deal do you think it's likely that they'll just carve out unique <laughs> uh, rules for the UK specifically with cloud gaming or or like how do you expect that to maybe go down and maybe none of us really really know but just trying to like play through the potential outcomes here and it's kind of it's obviously weird because it's a lot of this a lot of the decisions aren't even necessarily based in logic <laughs> that are happening so it's hard to talk logically about it um but yeah just in terms of understanding like the potential outcomes like is there a world in which that actually makes sense M- maybe Jonathan I'm curious to hear your take since you have experience working in these these big companies I am not a legal expert in terms of how that can play out, but uh, I, I, I do think there's probably a carve-out path or a compromise path, you know, in the UK if the EU and the US ends up approving the deal. But I am, I am hardly, uh, you know, a legal expert in these matters. Totally fair. <laughs> I, I think the issue is, is that if the UK says no, then it sets the precedent for all other European countries to also say no. Now, admittedly, the UK left the EU, so perhaps it could still be resurrected. But generally speaking, that's why you would do some of that. the first domino to fall without it being the, the last one. So I think to answer your question, Erin, it, it could be possible. But I think as soon as one other country says no, and the next one will probably be either Germany or Belgium, then I don't think the deal can go ahead no matter what. And that's what I personally suspect will happen. But we'll see. So just when you think you're done talking about this deal, I'm prepared to put money on the fact that it won't be the last time you talk about it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm so topic. tired of it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure Microsoft is at this point too. It was a, I did find it ironic that Bobby Kotick, of all people, though, would call out like a, a closed door secret meeting <laughs> for, for anyone who knows his reputation. Uh, but maybe that's why he knows. But uh, on the topic of other uh, regulations and, uh, and you know, deals and things like that going on, Apple had a, a little bit of a victory and a little bit of a, of a maybe not so much of a victory, a uh, recent lawsuit against Epic. I would say it's a pretty overwhelming victory for them, but with one interesting caveat, which we'll get to. So this relates to the Apple versus Epic Games lawsuit that happened a few years ago. It's been going on for quite a long time where Tim Sweeney, you know, tried his audacious move of launching Fortnite on the App Store and you didn't have to pay using Apple's own payment solutions, but you could go straight to Epic and get a discount from doing it and, you know, calling it antitrust and anti-competitive. So that finally had a decision ruled on it and Apple basically won pretty much everything, right? So they said that like, it, it basically, this there's an antitrust law known as the Sherman Act, and they said that everything that was kind of proposed fell outside of it. So, you know, it, it didn't work out basically. So Apple pretty much kind of celebrated a pretty big victory. Tim Sweeney noticeably quiet. I think though the one thing that is, well, I think there's a few things interesting on there. I mean, I have to say, I wasn't quite sure that that would be the, the case because you could argue with this sort of amount of, of transactions that, Apple and Google both make on their platform stores that um, I personally still think at some point in the future that will change. But it's interesting that this wasn't the one to do it. But the the one sort of thing that they did lose on out of the 10 cases was that they were actually um, 
not allowed now to prevent people from linking outside of the app. So what's kind of curious, especially for us in the Web3 world, we know this very well, is that you cannot basically say, oh, um, in this app, you can go here and you can also pay for these items without doing it in the app. You literally cannot mention it at all. You cannot hot link out. You can't do anything, right? So it's like very, very vague and that obviously keeps people in the app and it means they spend that. Now you will be allowed to do that. Now, so I, I believe that means you could have a link that links them immediately into a web page. Let's say you're on a Spotify app. That's a pretty popular app that people like to pay, right? You know, you can subscribe outside of your app or you can subscribe inside the app and they even try to push you outside because they say you'll actually save money and we as Spotify even make more money. So just do it. Everyone's a winner. But because of convenience and people not reading, they don't do it. But now I believe there'll be an option where you can press a button. It can probably even open a web browser window inside your app and you'd be able to do the transaction then. So that's pretty big, I think. Um, now, I am curious as something. I believe that as of right now today, if you were to try and submit an app that had that, they would still tell you, no, you're in, um, you know, uh, you're against our policies and they would ban you for it. But when this will get enforced, it'll be interesting to see. So I think that this is big news because this is something, that especially for us, for those of us in the Web3 world, this has been like a huge sticking point and, you know, has basically prevented people from going. In fact, that is one of the things that Tim Sweeney mentioned as being, you know, the anti-competitive things. It's like, you know, really stamping down on the new emerging technology before it gets the chance to go. I still don't think it's like a silver bullet, right? Because it's still going to look scary from the consumer point of view. But I do feel that it is some kind of progress. And, you know, a common theme, it's kind of funny, actually, of these, these podcasts, because sometimes, I don't know about you, but I get deja vu with the topics like Activision, cloud gaming, payments and regulations. Like, what episode are we on? Are we on 94 or on 44? You know, they all kind of go round. And this is like another thing. And I think one what's come up uh, many times in the past is we've said that we felt that like uh, Microsoft, for example, were trying to push their own app store that you'd be able to have on, on Apple. There have been some regulations recently saying that you will be able to sideload apps onto your, your iPhone, which wasn't allowed before. Now you're going to be able to link out to the payment. So I personally think that even though this was like a big victory for Apple, there was still something significant there. I don't think it was significant enough for uh, for Epic to justify the, the, the legal costs that they paid for this. Um, and I wonder, you know, I think Tim Sweeney perhaps didn't expect such a big defeat there. But I think that something meaningful has happened here. And I think it will be interesting to see what happens thereafter. And I'm curious who will kind of take advantage of this first, as it may well open the door for something big to happen there. I, I agree. I mean, it, it's super interesting because to your point, the ability to link out of these apps and subscribe out of these apps or make purchases out of these apps can be hugely, you know, even a positive to the companies who are able to do this now, right? Like it sort of felt outside of gaming, like Netflix was the only 800 pound gorilla that could ever get anybody to like, hey, you can actually only initiate the subscription on our website, not the app, because they were the 800-pound gorilla and nobody else could really get the conversion, including Spotify to the point that you spoke about. So now to be able to link out and really change the rev share could be quite meaningful for you know any one of the top 50 apps. It could be very financially meaningful. So yes, huge overall legal victory for Apple, but I think huge fiscal victory you know, for, for many, many, many you know, developers and game publishers, et cetera, to your point, to the degree that Apple actually arguably has to approve apps now, you know, with link outs. And, and also secondarily, as you said, to the Web3 world, right, which is increasingly had to had to live in two separate, you know, parallel ecosystems and now can live in one ecosystem. That it's, it's a nice boost to Web3 gaming. So I guess to, yeah. to clarify, just on the other side of this, though, um, I, I think Apple won nine out of its out of the 10 <laughs> possible, um, you know, stipulations they were battling over. And I don't I don't know what all of the other nine are, but as I understand it, a lot of it revolves around third party app stores and alternative payment methods. And so, you know, whereas, you know, these anti steering provisions are great, it still actually probably does shut down <laughs> a lot of the hopes and dreams that people had for those um, alternatives and even something like um, payments, you, you know, where it was allowed elsewhere, um, Apple was still finding ways to make its cut, and so maybe that doesn't matter as as much as as people originally thought. But the third party app store um, side of it um, is, I think, pretty notable for games because when we talked in previous episodes, we we're making the point that probably really the only candidates 
that could do something impactful in a third party app store are the larger game companies that can, you know, whether it's Xbox and Game Pass or maybe if Sony wants to start porting more stuff to and supporting mobile in some way um, or Epic and their Epic Games store, which, of course, I'm sure was top of mind, like directly in this and in these court battles. um, It seems like that is a major loss here. And so I'm not sure what's next in that battle, whether it's just trying to attack new regions and then it becomes a domino effect or something else, or it just has, has to be given time. I don't know. Um, but I think it's also worth just noting kind of the the downside of that lawsuit from there. And what was interesting to me from um, Tim Sweeney, he he tweeted, let me see if I can pull up the quote real fast. Okay. He said, the, the court upheld the ruling that Apple's restraints have a, quote, substantial anti-competitive effect that harms consumers, end quote. They found we didn't prove our Sherman Act case. And for those who don't know, the Sherman Act was like the first set of antitrust laws that were created in the United States in 1890. And there have been other other laws that have, you know, come and been created since then. But the, the thing I just want to point out that's that's also a little crazy here just on the regulatory front is that a lot of these decisions that are being made in courts are made using laws and acts that were created in the 1800s. And it's it's sort of absurd to, to be able to make the right decisions and regulate modern digital companies on, you know, case studies of like railroad companies and, you know, manufacturing companies from over 100 years ago. Um, and so, you know, just as an aside, I think something should change there. I don't know if it will, and it's probably not even worth like digging into too much, but um, you know, you know how those things rile me up, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see the impacts in games. My, my thinking is that anti steering provisions are going to be a much larger deal for companies that are not games. It's, you know, the, the dating apps, the Spotify's of the world, those kinds of companies will probably get 90% of the benefit of this, this change. But, you know, Anil, as you're saying, the Web3 side of things in particular um, is probably where it's most interesting in games. I guess you could say if you have a large enough brand, um, like a Call of Duty or Supercell or something like that, you might be able to get away with pointing large audiences elsewhere. Um, but Web3 really is the the angle that is probably most interesting from an innovation being unlocked standpoint. So I'm I'm curious to know like how you see Web3 on mobile changing specifically because of this. Do you think it un- unleashes the the floodgates? Do you think it's going to be a, a small trigger of trickle of teams still figuring out what to do about this? Or how how do you see this impacting Web3 on on mobile over the next couple of years? It will still be a slow trickle, unfortunately. I think it's something that there's a few different people who've got different playbooks that are trying to figure out people like uh, Immutable X, people like um, Skywe with their sequence wallet. There's quite a few other ones sort of trying to do it here. But this is still a, a step in the right direction. I mean, I do know that when I've spoken to people who are in this world as well, everyone kind of has this belief that it will happen. It's just going to take a bit of time to go there. And it's like a fluid situation and, and this would happen. So I think you will definitely see a few apps try to, to utilize this. I think, I, to be honest, I already know some apps that did manage to put it off already. But then even though it's not legal within Apple's laws, it's only that they're not making sizable revenues enough. The one that did happen, I don't know if you're familiar with a title called Stepan. They actually were already allowing you to do this. And then because that started doing like 200 million a month, then all of a sudden, oh, it, <laughs> that someone did review it properly. And they're like, no, 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 that can't be allowed in this app. So um, people will definitely try it. And I think it will do it. But I, I, for example, I don't think that, you know, this time next month, it's all of a sudden going to lead to a, a huge cataclysmic shift. But I think people will be trying. I, I think you're right to say it's the other gaming companies because there are big deals with like um, providers like Exola and, and things like this of people trying to move around it. Like, you know, if you do the sort of volume that Supercell or, you know, Activision Blizzard does on mobile, then paying less than 30% is absolutely huge to your to your bottom line, right? So you absolutely would be doing it. So I think they're more likely to try it us. And some of them, in the case of Supercell, have already been experimenting with that stuff. So I think they will be the first movers. I think it's just it's nice for Web3 because 
it means that some of the, as Jonathan mentioned, is kind of living in two separate worlds. It's a huge issue there. Uh, if we could just all live in the same world, please, that would be a big, <laughs> a big change there. So um, I have to say that our team is very excited for it. Um, but I think that's still got quite some room to go before it's mainstream on, on mobile we're working with. Do you see a lot of um, potential then for Apple to just do selective enforcement of stuff to find ways to shut down people that like they don't like doing that? Meaning like, let's say you're you're a big, huge company, like with the Netflix thing where they're like, oh, well, we probably can't get away with finding some reason to deny their app. But with the smaller players, right, where they're trying to come in, say, on Web3 stuff or like because obviously Supercell could probably get away with it, right, where they could just be like, oh, because they've already had their web shop. Now they can kind of direct people to it. Uh, that'll that'll be a big thing, right? Who knows how fast they'll implement that? But they definitely will, right? But a small fish coming in on Web3, like even, you know, like yourselves uh, with Blast Royale, maybe not being this huge thing, you know, do you think they'd just be like, you know, we'll find another reason to deny your guys' app? Uh, because they do that, right? They have pretty selective enforcement. Uh, that's been a big deal for a long time. And of course, that's even part of why Epic was pushing this case was those kinds of issues. I mean, do you expect that like the, that sort of retaliatory uh, behavior will still kind of block a lot of Web3 games? I hope not, <laughs> but I fear you could be right. Um, as I say, it tends to happen only when people start picking up traction and it, it goes crazy. I think when you're doing you know, a small amount of volume per month, you don't really need to realize it. But I think it is quite possible that if one of these games does blow up and starts hitting the kind of 5 million a month revenue plus, then it could be called up. But I think as well, though, that both them and Google will know they're like they can try and contain this sort of thing for as long as possible but they'll never be able to stop it and so surely at some point they'll we I think especially if it's like a a well-established or at least good-natured developer that they'll rather work hand in hand and have them using their own solutions rather than do some external one um you know I do suspect that both platform holders are probably working on their own tech in the background to do some of this stuff in a more seamless way that plays ball with their own APIs that would be the smart way to do it but then who knows a lot of these companies did just lay off 10% of the global workforce so maybe those projects are on pause <laughs> but I I think that I always think I think that Maybe it's a mistaken belief, but I think the feeling in the industry is that it's going to happen. It's just a matter of time of, of when, not if, and it will probably happen within the next two years. I think sooner than that. I think really, as I say, it's a bit of a chicken and the egg situation. It probably needs that title or titles to start blowing up to really force the issue. Hopefully, at least it gets them to lower that 30%, maybe down to a more reasonable number as a compromise, uh, just to stop people from going off the store and things like that. But uh, speaking of large volumes of, of revenue and uh, and on a lighter note, uh, we got uh, a bit more follow up on Super Mario Brothers movie. Yeah, so here we are back to the worlds of IP, you know, transmedia, nostalgia all came together here. So Super Mario Brothers was the first 2023 movie to make a billion dollars. I believe it's the fifth movie since the pandemic shut down to make a billion dollars. What's Important to note, all five of those movies have been legacy IP or sequel, right? So, you know, in, in the ongoing theme of like every one of these uh, episodes sounds like every other episode, we're back to, you know, sequels, nostalgia, legacy IP being the most valuable things that we live in. You know, this world of transmedia, you know, IP moving from games to television to movies is not new, but it's clearly having another moment, right? And potentially the first multi-billion dollar moment. I mean, Mario's perfect, right, though? I mean, it's like, it's a little bit like Top Gun of gaming, right? Which is like, you've got everybody who grew up with Mario taking all their kids who love Mario. You know, my son's school had a had a trip to the Mario movie. Every parent was as, ex as excited as every kid. Like, it's, it's where these worlds come together in the best way. And I think we've all discussed the upsides and the downsides, right? The upsides are going to be, we're going to see more incredible you know, exploitation of our favorite IP and we get to introduce it to our kids and our kids' friends. And the and the downside is like, does that close the door towards, you know, development and new, new IP, et cetera? You know, I'm not so worried about the latter, right? You know, there's always been independent movies and independent games, despite the fact that, you know, the top 10 lists have looked like this. But, you know, seems like another win for the most beloved IP in the world can succeed on any platform. I got to imagine as well that it's had a pretty positive effect on Mario franchise in general. I know they were running some sales uh, on the games and things like that. Uh, Mario Land only like recently came out here in uh, in the U.S. in uh, Universal Studios, and obviously had been doing uh, you know fairly well in Japan after finally opening up after COVID. And so, 
you, you got to imagine that like, this is this is much more money than just that that billion dollars yep. as well for that franchise, and then Illumination as well, right? Like we're also forgetting that this was another potential franchise winner for them, coming off of you know the Despicable Me movies. They they've just kind of, I'm sure, made ridiculous amounts of money off of, uh, like. I got, I got to imagine, you know, they're they're thinking sequel, like hard right now, uh, more than anything else, or, or you know, bringing it over to like the transmedia stuff, like TV shows or whatever. I obviously even the movie itself is referencing the old TV show, right? Where it's almost p- possibly cyclic in that point, where it goes back to another TV show, referencing the movie, referencing the TV show, and and things like that. Um, I I got to wonder though, like, do we see then like uh, a Zelda movie as a follow up to this, right? Because we've got the new Zelda game coming out and things like that. Seems like a hot time. They know they could trust Illumination to do it. Agreed. Or even a, or even extension into theater, right? Like you know, I've watched the I've watched the explosion of Bluey in America, right? That great Australian <laughs> show. And of course, I had to take my son to like the Bluey play, you know, and he had to stand in line for the Bluey stuffies. And you know, his favorite Bluey stuffies were sold out, so we have to order them on Amazon on the phone while we're standing there in line because he's in tears, right? Like you get, you can exploit this stuff in a in a million multi billion dollar ways. Well, hopefully it uh, it doesn't lead to a, a bad sequel, but uh, <laughs> you never know when they when they get greedy like that. But either way, like I, I think it's good to see that you know nostalgia grab was was successful in the sense of uh, actually people enjoying it. I think for the most part, it wasn't one of those ones I think that just made money off everyone going and trying it out. The re- reviews are pretty decent, things like that, so not too bad. Uh, but we did have another hit come out uh, recently on mobile, though this time from a different Asian company. Yeah, uh, Mahoyo, the the Chinese developer that most people know is behind Genshin Impact, looks like they have another hit on their hands. The the new game, Honkai Star Rail, which is more of a a sci fi theme turn based collector RPG, um, apparently received twenty million downloads in just its first day, uh, which is a, a very big number. Um, and it's only been out a week, so there's not a ton of great data yet. But according to Data.ai, it looks like the game might be up to 45 million downloads just on mobile. And I'm not even sure that's counting everything um, in China, um, too. So um, the downloads have have had legs so far. And I'm not going to comment on the revenue side yet, because there's not much to comment on there. Um, But clearly, it's a very strong start in terms of getting users in the door. And it's even outpacing Genshin Impact's launch, uh, which is a pretty killer um, outcome um, for this game in its, its early days. So um, I wouldn't say that this game is as revolutionary as Genshin, but it still has the potential to be a high-performing game. And of course, not everything needs to be revolutionary. But in the, the short time I've played, um, the game is clearly well-polished. It exists within the same Hoyo-verse. Uh, it takes a lot of the same character collection mechanics of, of Genshin, but puts it into a turn-based type of game, which is a very proven model um, on mobile. Um, this is a game that's probably not going to perform as well on PC as an open world Genshin style game, um, but it doesn't necessarily need to for it to be another big win for Mahoyo. Um, and I, I have a couple more comments, but I guess before we even go into that, I'm curious if if any of you have played around with this game at all, whether you have early impressions or anything along those lines. Yeah, I've checked it out. I, I have to say, I think this company is really being slept on. This company is yeah. a juggernaut that is coming big time. I think no one really talks about them. This is now really impressive. Two really sort of big juggernaut titles and more are definitely coming. I, I kind of feel that they are almost the Gen Z equivalent of, let's say, a Blizzard, an Epic, someone like that, that in 10 years time when um Aaron Jr is hosting the Navic podcast along with Devin Jr that they will have grown up playing games by this studio and these will be the ones that are sort of really thought of in an iconic way as the same as sort of Nintendo IP and things like that and um the, the game's pr- pretty good I mean I, I think here's a key thing I want to get across right they're, they're not really for me uh, I'm definitely in that sort of millennial strip boomer mentality right it's a nice enough game. I don't particularly like their art style, but that art style has really tapped in. And that's the big reason why they're winning so well, I feel. And the reason why I mentioned, you know, like it being a kind of blizzard is what I feel the effect that they've got is they're now sort of being able to launch any game. And the hype around that game is huge before anything's even been shown because 
the sort of love of their characters and universes there. And that's such a strong, again, we just literally mentioned IP, right? And, and that being so prevalent in, in, in the Mario Brother movie's success. And they've got that already. So, I mean, it's pretty good. I have to say a lot of people in my team have been playing the game. They were sharing it already. They, they love it as well. They think it's really good, solid edition and it's different too. Again, similar kind of mechanics. So, um, I think, yeah, perhaps this game is, is safer, as you say, than, um, you know, what Genshin did, although Genshin Impact was just kind of like the Zelda game, but with a gacha <laughs> added onto it, right? But um, the polish is great. I mean, the one thing you have to say about this company is they've said that many times that I think just Genshin Impact, it cost them 200 million a year just to run the live operations. But it shows that quality can always win. And I think it's also a huge success story for China as well, in that in the past, people always like, well, you know, that they can sort of replicate, but they can't really innovate and they'll never really be able to achieve the sort of levels that Western developers can do. And it's like, well, hold my beer because <laughs> they're coming and they're taking, you know, this studio has already taken over. I kind of feel on, on, on mobile, especially. So, um, yeah, I recommend they do check it out or if not pay more attention to what this company is up to, because I think they're only on one trajectory and that trajectory is up. Yeah. Curious if this might um, end up being kind of a, a, of a transmedia play as well. Cause you talk about the IP and, uh, the characters being beloved and stuff like that. Now, like obviously, if it was a if it was a Japanese game, right, I would expect anime to come out of that. Uh, but that does, that doesn't mean like they, that they can't do that. But I'm just curious if this could be something that if it catches on in the West with the way anime has been really picking up in the West in general, like more more so than even it had you know before, where like there, maybe the 90s there was a little bit of interest, and maybe in the early 2000s there was some more growing. And now anime is pretty huge here if that could kind of really explode and open more opportunity for China to, to get games over here, if uh, whether it be through that company or other companies, if they're able to kind of piggyback on that, that growing interest just in that style and that type of game uh, over here, especially as you said with Gen Z. They, they should do it if they haven't already thought about it. I have to say, if you look at things like Comic-Con, the amount of people that dress up as characters from this game is insane. So I feel like they've already achieved it. What, what you're talking about, that's why they're successful. They've already tapped in. It's like Gen Z loves Genshin Impact. They love this new game. So... Yeah, how they exploit it, I guess, well, maybe they should employ you. It seems like you know what you're talking about, Devin, but that's <laughs> exactly the sort of thing that I feel that they, they should be doing. Whether or not and how they're allowed to do that, that and what will infringe upon it, I don't know. But if you looked at maybe like Arcane, which was Riot Games' play of the League of Legends universe, something like that, I think, would, would be amazing in this sort of setting, 100%. Um, I haven't. I can't really think though, off the top of my head, of um, a Chinese studio doing that something outside of China. You know, making it for a Western audience. But I mean, one thing I think is also worth mentioning is that this game is not only doing gangbusters outside in the West, but if you look at the Chinese stores, it's smashing it there as well. And that's another reason why I think it's important to take this game seriously because, and the studio seriously, because oftentimes you might get like. Candy Crush, for example, is huge in the West, but in Asia, whilst it's done well, it's definitely not on the same level as, you know, Honor of Kings or something like that, right? Um, whereas this game is basically in equal positions in both charts, and that is a serious level of revenue that's going to brought into the company. Yeah, I thought that your earlier comparison to, like, the next Nintendo of sorts was was interesting, and the analogy that was coming to my mind is, is more like Riot, where there might just be, like, a few steps behind Riot games, and have naturally more of a of a mobile bent because of, of where they, they come from in the world, but that's more the trajectory that I'm I'm thinking that they might have, but you're totally right that this this is a company that's being slept on. The second part of my notes was, was really just commenting that if there's any private gaming company that could go public that hasn't, Mahoyo should be either at the top of that list or close to the top of that list. And um, according to Data.ai, which again, I don't think tracks like all third-party app stores, especially in China. So this is um, certainly like undercounting the total, but it's averaged 102 and, and obviously not like PC either, but it's averaged $102 million in revenue per month over the past 12 months, and which puts it well over a billion dollar um, run rate with all of those caveats. And that's also not including you know the revenue that's going to come from this game that, that was just launched too. And so the trajectory here and the size that they're operating at um, is, is very... Uh, noteworthy and yeah they should consider going public at some point and i know being china based and all the 
foreign listings, shenanigans, and how that is all political, that certainly is playing a role here in the same way that, you know, a company like ByteDance, which is enormous because of TikTok, it also, um, you know, is, is still private to, to this day. Um, and so there, there are some of, some of that weirdness at, at play in terms of how it can really play financially on a global stage. But, but yeah, what, what they're doing, just fundamentals based with, with their games, building their connected universe. Um, and, and yeah, the, the kind of the, the unique ACG art style that is increasingly resonating around the world. It's, it's setting up Mahoyo to, to be on an interesting trajectory. And this, this game is probably just one more stepping stone and whatever that trajectory is, is going to look like. The funny thing is, is you're right to say they're either number one or two. And the company that I would have as either above them or below them is also China. Well, actually, they're based in Hong Kong, and that's Lilith Games, who make AFK mm-hmm. Arena, if you're familiar with that game. So I think that's another one that seems to have tapped in. They've also got a similar art style that's also working on Gen Z. It's working really well. It seems like everything they do is, you know, just smashing it out of the park as well i think that's another company that should be looked uh, at quite closely but if it's similar things i'm not sure that they can go <laughs> ipo either which makes it kind of a challenge yeah and honestly like we're just in a dearth of companies going public in the games industry anyways obviously we saw you know with kind of the peak of the last bull market it led to you know good you know notable companies like roblox and unity going public and obviously, you know, through SPACs and all that stuff, we saw, you know, a, a lower tier of, you know, company go public too that, you know, aren't moving the needle as much as some of the big ones. But since then, it's really been quiet um, in terms of, you know, upstart gaming companies. I mean, both on the, the M&A front, which is, um, you know, there's some action, but it's 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 slowed down in large part. But especially on the, the IPO side, it would be really great to see um, a new wave of kind of these next gen companies um, start to to make it out there, and that would just be exciting. On the topic of exciting mobile games, Jonathan, there's a a mobile game you've been excited to talk about. Sure. So this week, Mythical launched early access to NFL Rivals. It again ties into a lot of the things that we've been talking about today, right? Like obviously, super powerful, you know, IP with the NFL. A combination of building a game in a Web 2 space and a Web 3 space simultaneously. There's a standalone Web 3 store. Interestingly, could benefit from what we were talking about with with Epic over time. I believe they claimed 150,000 players in the first two weeks of the soft launch. What's super interesting is the way they've been talking about it, right? Like the marketing has been very much like what you expect around the NFL, which is, you know, they, they had a marketing beat around the Super Bowl. They just had a marketing beat around the draft, which makes a ton of sense, leverage all the power that you can out of the IP. But what's really interesting is they've been re- they've been talking about gameplay first and they've almost been leading with Web 2, right? They've almost been selling it as a Web 2 game for broad for a broad set of gamers. And there's a Web 3 component if you like, if you feel comfortable. And I, I think that's an acknowledgement of putting gameplay first, which I think is always more important. And I think the gamer doesn't care about the mechanic or the underlying you know, financials as we were talking about. But also I think it's an admission that sort of blockchain and Web3 and anything crypto has brought a bit of toxicity you know, in the, in the last six or nine months. And so as much as they're sort of talking about, well, it's about a game for gamers, quietly, I think that's an admission of the toxicity around kind of Web3 in certain parts of the world. But I do believe that like the game experience and the gameplay and, you know, should always be forward and the, and the underlying, you know, what it's built on should be ladder. I would also say, and with the big giant caveat that I worked with both of the co-founders, John Linden and Jamie Jackson, I think this is a perfect management combination of like, Jamie is like, High creative sense, high creative style, always gamer first. I launched DJ Hero with him. I launched the reboot of Guitar Hero with him. He was always the voice for the gamer. He was always the voice for the creative, you know, in the business meetings at a highly commercial organization like Activision. And John Linden came into gaming from being a technologist first and kind of built a lot of the studio side stuff that helped power like the live ops and only on and microtrans behind Call of Duty when it kind of went from a console game you know, to largely like an MTX powered or at least MTX add-on game. 
So you've got this incredible partnership of a creative and a technologist, which is which is a super powerful combination. So I'm a big believer in the two of them as executives. I'm a big believer in them as a partnership. And, you know, once again, when you put like a strong studio together with triple A, you know, IP, it, it's hard not to win. Not, you know, none of this is easy, but, uh, you know, I, I think we're seeing a lot of early traction here. And, and I think they can continue to push the Web 2 side of it into kind of mass appeal, right? And the Web 3 side is, is there for those who wish to participate. So do you think then having the, it'd be football, uh, American football, just to be clear for, for yes. UK people here, uh, is, is it going to help, you know, sell the web, web three aspect for people? Cause obviously we've seen like things like so rare, the other kind of football, uh, and, and, yep. you know, the, the NBA top shot and those kind of things really push like, you know, because sports people are into collectibles, stuff like that, uh, push this kind of into the mobile space, maybe a bit more for the web three stuff than we've been able to do so far just because of like the the audience expansion and the optionality of this stuff? Absolutely. Putting my, you know, current CEO hat on as somebody in the sports space, like I'm a massive believer in that like sports super fandom is going to be monetized through web three, through blockchain, through collectibles, through gaming. Y- you know, it's it to me that's DraftKings 2.0 or DraftKings Web 3.0, depending on how you want to define it. Right. So I, I'm I'm a massive believer that this is where sports is going. And, you know, I'm watching the NFL space, I'm watching the NBA space, I'm watching the NBA 2K space. Y- y- you know, I, I really think this is a new monetization angle, not just for sports teams and leagues, but given Given the new NIL rules, it's going to be a monetization avenue for amateur athletes. Like I, I, I have bet my career on sports plus Web three plus gaming is going to be a highly profitable space for all involved. Is this the kind of uh, game though that would benefit from the the, the anti steering stuff we were just talking about earlier, like link, being able to link out, or is that more just like secondary market kind of thing where they actually probably are fine with people staying in the app and and giving Apple the 30% cut to get like a primary sale? Like how is this? Kind of I can't see how it hurts. Right. I mean, they, they built a standalone, you know, web three store, you know, like Neil was speaking about earlier, this is the, the default web three gaming thing. So, you know, even if you can move 5% of that standalone business, you know, or 5% of your 2.0 to a 3.0 business through linking, you know, through the confidence that, you know, at least initiating that transaction or initiating the move through the app ecosystem that, you know, and trust, it certainly can't hurt their PL. After this epic case, I would be going back and redoing my financial models if I was mythical and the NFL in a more optimistic way, right? I would I would expect higher conversion, higher participation, higher ARPU, higher LTV. I can't imagine how it does anything but help their PL. Hopefully they could pull that off then. Definitely. Um, I, yeah. I guess we'll have to wait, as Anil said, right? Probably gonna be a little bit of like a, a honeymoon period uh, before that stuff is enforced. I'm not sure if Apple can necessarily appeal that. Uh, or try and kind of shut that down in the meantime. But like you said, like now's the time to start thinking about the financials, figure out like, okay, well, how can we take advantage of that now that that just happened as well? Because I'm sure they were focused on launched uh, in just getting it out there first, right? Uh, but I think this yeah. is- And the irony, the irony, of course, sorry, the, sorry to step on you. The irony, of course, is that, you know, the NFL is, uh, their their media rights are now owned by rivals, right? They're now owned by Amazon and Google. But also as you're starting to see Fang buy rights into this stuff, I think you can see some increased pressure to make that happen, right? So if I was Major League Baseball, right, and all my media rights are on Apple TV+, Plus, I think that gives me more leverage when these conversations start happening, you know, about the, uh, you know, the Major League Baseball or the Premier League or, you know, any of that stuff, again, back to transmedia, right, when Fang increasingly has media rights to these large sports properties, and and Fang is participating in multiple streams of revenue that will be increased pressure to get these deals done and get this stuff approved. I'm curious to get a to, to slightly tweak the direction of the topic. I'm curious to get a pulse check on Mythical. Like hearing your endorsement um, on the the leadership is is great to to hear, Jonathan. And I just and I haven't been following this company that closely. I just know that you know when Web three gaming was taking off, this was like a more of a like a flagship type of company that was getting off the ground. Everyone was excited to see what they spin up. Um, and over the past couple of years, I guess it's been pretty quiet. And, you know, it's great to see that they're, you know, spinning up, you know, interesting projects like this NFL game, uh, et cetera. 
but it seems like they're the weight that they have in the Web3 space has fallen, not because of necessarily like missteps, um, but more just because there's been a lot going on while they have been quiet. So I'm curious if anyone has thoughts on like the state of mythical, what we should be looking out <laughs> uh, w- with them or, you know, what their impacts might be going forward. I mean, who hasn't fallen in Web3? I think that's that's the thing, right? No one's really kind of gone sure. on. Um, I, I can say, I remember like last year, they had some really big sort of marketing activity and stuff in the space that was probably all prepaid for. This year, it's completely been toned down, reflective of the current market and, and general drops. I don't think that's something to be held against them. I think one interesting thing specifically about Mythical is they were embroiled in a little bit of a situation, right, where two of the former founders have left to make their own fund and had prior knowledge. And that's kind of interesting as to where that's going to lead. I don't really know too much into it other than that is a thing that is known about. And it's kind of the same of them. But I think, you know, Jonathan, um, I really like what a lot of stuff he's been saying about them that, you know, with their kind of experience, their proven pedigree, and also the IPs that they have, like, I think, you know, as mentioned before, with the kind of the, the Apple subject is like, these would be the sort of people that could make the big song and dance and the noise to kind of push things forward. I wonder though, with someone like that, is that something that they want to do or, or they don't? I think, again, if you look at like, who are the biggest players in Web3 that you would really expect the big, big pushes from, they're certainly one of them. I think Immutable is another one. Um, you know, when are they coming with like, uh, Guild of Guardians has been delayed multiple times, but that was, you know, one of the ones, <laughs> Devin's laughing here, exactly. So, you, you know, I know it's not Vaporware, but that's got like a star-studded team as well. When is that going to drop? Um, there are a few other ones. Like, what about Gala Games, right? When are they going to be pushing out all their stuff? They've got Will Wright, Peter Molyneux and things like this. It's interesting that a lot of these people haven't gone yet, but it's only so long. Uh, who's going to be the first ones to go? What kind of, you know, carnage is it going to cause? I, you know, I'm excited. These games can't wait forever. Someone's got to go first. I'm sure one will succeed. So um, we'll have to see. But I think it's interesting that, you know, even though we talk about this, it's only early access, right? It's not really the big thing. But NFL is always tied to the start of the season, right? That's my experience. I actually used to work on an NFL card game with Gree when the, the ex Funzio guys and stuff like that. So I remember that they were like the big things, right? And then you probably really probably want to peak your activity for Super Bowl and stuff like that. So I guess what's interesting about a game like this is they can't sleep on it forever. You know that if there's going to be a push, you can guess when it's going to be. And and fall is that time, right? And then we'll see, I guess, go out big. And then, yeah, it, what I think is really great, though, especially about NFL-themed um, games, is that very specifically they do amazing in the US. And they don't do so well elsewhere, but it's targeted for that. So it would be amazing to see a blockchain-based game going hard with an IP like that, that's going to put the cat amongst the pigeons, as we would say here. Never heard that one before. Definitely, definitely going to steal that. <clears throat> <laughs> well, I think we just have a little bit of, a little bit of time left here for our last topic that I think is, it should be a meaty one, uh, which is digging into uh, the, the just kind of ballooning budgets that we've seen uh, in games in general, and maybe some of the unsustainability that comes with that. Yes, let me take this one. This one, I'm, I'm really would like to hear what the panel have to say because it's something that I think we hint about a lot on this podcast and our weekly or, or fortnightly talks, but we've never really covered as a topic. So perhaps now's the time to give it. So this is like um, taken uh, from a Kotaku article. Um, and yeah, specifically, we're talking about blockbuster game costs spiraling out of control. And a lot of this has kind of been the fallout of what's been shared in the public with the Activision Blizzard takeover and some sort of stories heard in it. But, um, you know, what they basically said is that, you know, some games are having uh, budgets of over $200 million. Some people now thinking even over a billion has been spent all in when you include like marketing, so on and so forth with, with game production. And that's just taking things to a level that's just never really been seen before. I mean, I, I don't think this is something that's a surprise to people who have been in the industry. Certainly it's not to me. I mean, having kind of lived through the eras, I can certainly say that, for example, take PlayStation 2. On PlayStation 2, you could make a game with, let's say, 30 people in a year and be pretty positive that it would be ROI positive. And that meant you could even take some creative risks in terms of the games that you could make. We went into PS3 era, all of a sudden, not so much, because now the game probably needed 70 to 100 people. And it probably took 
three to four years to develop. So that kind of changes it. Then we went into the advent of the quadruple A game, right? I don't know if that's like a phrase that's still used, but you'd start seeing job postings for like triple A isn't enough anymore. We need an extra A to work here if you want to work on this IP. And, and you know, are we getting to quintuple A sort of phase? That's kind of what it's been hinting here. And the, the thing is, it, it is working, right? Like you can still see that like, what you know, what are the sort of takeaways that we see from this, right? So we are, we're kind of seeing that like the games at the top of the pile make crazy amounts of money, right? Look at like how many copies Grand Theft Auto Five has sold. That's something that I, I think I quote every time that I'm on here. So I've quoted it again. Um, the latest Call of Duty, how, you know, in just like in three or four days was it reached a billion? Like as a record, Aaron may be correct me. I, mean, I do remember we talked about that in a previous podcast. So, so that's interesting that we can definitely see that the success is there. And, you know, if you compare these budgets to things like movies, like look at the Avatar movie that James Cameron just worked on and how that did it's it's perhaps you know a drop in the ocean you could say but is it sustainable because the video games industry has seen crashes before right it's seen uptimes and downtimes even people that we felt could do no wrong have had fairly high profile failures i think nintendo being a really good example of that how after the wii we never really speak about the wii u but that thing was an absolute you know mess and, and luckily the switch and you know ds sort of fix it enough that we don't really talk about that that was really poor decision from them so as people that are also sort of you know in the industry i'm curious and, and sort of things I'd like to ask you, you know how high do you think both development and marketing costs will go because you know marketing right now is it can be a i think the reason why you see a stifle of innovation in the industry because you just IP is great because the marketing is cheaper. That's the sort of TLDR on that. Um, but is that the way? Are there other ways to kind of hack it? What does that mean for innovation? And is it sustainable? And I think maybe the thing that I want to sort of tackle on, which is sort of two things, is like, you know, do things need to, to, to change, right? Is, is gaming now actually a closed door? Because I sort of remember being like a teenager and wanting to get into games. And I was fortunate enough to do that. It felt like, oh, anything was possible you could do anything but have we kind of already reached a stage where that's actually a bit of a lie and the big players have already been established and we're sort of in the end game so tons to talk about there i'm curious who wants to pick this up there, there's so much to unpack there i i mean at the first level like you no surprise to me i lived those call of duty pnls for five years you know so, so none of it was a surprise at all I think, you know, when you talk about marketing and dev costs, I think at least on Call of Duty, one of the things that we saw happen over time is as we moved, you know, into an MTX and a, you know, microtrans model, the cost of dev went up because you weren't sort of one and done, like, you know, back to the old days of like, okay, a Call of Duty might have cost $200 million to make, but you shipped it and didn't really cost anything after that. You made a couple of DLC drops and that's it. And now I think that same article you quote is like, hey, there's not even one lead studio anymore. There's 1.5, right? You know, because they're always like, you know, okay, Treyarch made the game and then Raven made all the add-on stuff or whatever, right? So dev costs go up. The interesting thing is post-launch, marketing costs go down, arguably, if you've built the right kind of CRM feedback loops, right? Because you shouldn't be doing any mass marketing anymore when you're talking about add-on content, right? And live ops, you should just be marketing to people who own the game and it's an installed base and in-game messaging and, you know, other CRM, you know, highly targeted, you know, retargeted digital ads. So you should see for the biggest IP ballooning and continuing to balloon development costs. You should actually see marketing come down as a percentage, you know, of, of, of their overall mix and arguably that should lead to like greater ARPU and LTV. And when you look at Activision's, you know, public financials, that's in fact what you see, right? You see increased revenue and you actually see declining, you know, concurrent players, right? Like they're making more money, but there's fewer players playing. And so arguably at that level, it's working kind of exactly how it should. Like margin is still very good, right? Um, to sort of hit another point about is the door closed, potentially the console door is closed, right? Or the console door is closing. But again, I'm going to go back to the movie analogy. I think the mobile door or the Web3 door is more open than it's ever been. And I think as long as you're building your P&Ls and you're building your team and you're building your ambitions to the potential market and you're not overspending at that level, there's great room for innovation and there's great room for new IP. And as that new IP expands, you know, and grows, it can, it could earn its way up to console in essence, even if that still matters. So I actually don't see 
innovation going away. I actually don't see doors closing except for potentially console, right? Potentially console is like the platform for winners, the platform for quad A, right? You know, we've talked about this, I think, you know, eight out of the 10 or seven out of the 10 to the top 10 list are SQL console, quad A licensed, whatever. But I see a whole ecosystem below that, that is open, that is potentially more open than it's ever been open before in in part as a response to that other thing. So I, I think, you know, I think it's all true at the same time, if that makes sense. That's a really good answer. Can, can I ask, like, you know, having lived that, how far ahead did you see that, right? Because they were very innovative, to be fair, right? In the sense that Call of Duty went from being like a one studio game to a two studio game to a three studio game to having kind of like five year, 10 year roadmaps. Yeah. And so you must have seen this and this must have been planned quite a while in advance and, and sort of do this. And, you know, actually, we just touched actually, you know, even on mobile with like Mahoyo, how you know, they have 200 million live operation costs to support a game than actually to launch a new game. You think in your head what the budget is for that. Did they double their company? Did they do the size? Yeah. That, that's why I can see the sort of challenges here. And um, yeah, like I say, I, I, I see it's both good and bad, right? Because I think from the consumer, the quality of games you get these days is absolutely ridiculous. Like sometimes I feel like what people are complaining about is like, I mean, you know, wow, have you not seen the things that we play? This is like impossible to believe. But then at the same time, it's like, how can you reach that quality barrier if you're a new entrant? So I'm curious it, in your thoughts it, on that. It's interesting. The biggest structural change in my tenure at Activision, and I kind of lived the transition from like console plus a teeny bit of DLC to like, you know, loot crates and all that stuff was really moving from like annual green light processes into three year green light processes into five year green light processes. Like I actually didn't see 10 year green light processes like you laid out, but this idea of like almost like a, like a real triple a quad a package good, right? Like you were Procter and Gamble or Pepsi, like there were five year franchise plans, right? And franchise planning became more important and sort of like making CapEx investments for three years from now or five years from now, right? Or starting to green light the next Call of Duty three years before it launches as opposed to a year before it launches. That like that was the structural change during my tenure. And I can only imagine it it going further since then. Right. But uh, but but that was the big structural thing. Right. It, it's like you have to have a longer lead and a longer vision and you have to be capitalized to the ability to get there, you know, and you have to make calls with like less you're making calls, you, you know, with less current information and more future state information. Yeah, I think this conversation is super interesting. I mean, I think to simplify it, like the costs are going up because the revenue opportunities are also going up as you have more players on more platforms spending money in in, in more ways. Um, Digital makes margins higher, et cetera, et cetera. Um, So, I mean, as a a gamer, I'd like to see, you know, these bigger and better games. Like, it's exciting, you know, like recently playing a game like God of War. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, this is like incredible, you know, and like what they're able to to pull off and so i'm like yeah throw more money at that like we'll give you more money th- when you make these these like amazing games um the the couple other things i would add to the conversation at least as a as an outside observer and not having lived these these pnls um like like you both is that i still think that you know even though we're seeing these costs rise and perhaps in justified ways at least some of the time that we still are at least entering a period of like financial fitness for for these companies where they still are being very mindful of the money that they are spending. And we've seen so far over the past few months that's led to layoffs. Um, it might continue to lead to to more of that in the future. Um, but the other, you know, as we kind of, you know, think about the trajectory over the next several years is that I do think that AI <laughs> is going to have like some some impact here in terms of how companies think about their efficiency and how they think about their cost structure. And I think the question is going to become, um, you know, at, at some point when these tools become more viable and easier to integrate into all the systems, et cetera, is the question of whether, hey, do we leverage these tools to just need less people and therefore you know, can make these games even more profitable? Or is are we going to continue to see high cost and including the AI tools of these, these companies go even harder and even bigger um, and taking things even to another level beyond what we see here? 
And my guess is it's going to be both. We're going to see some IPs that are the biggest IPs in the world continue just to get bigger and bigger and better. And that's going to be awesome and a lot to look forward to. And then we'll see others that maybe don't have those same heights and where it makes sense for them to be managed more from a cost. I don't want to say a cost first standpoint, but they don't have that same level of ceiling to reinvest into at that same rate. And I think that's going to be a really interesting dynamic to watch over over the future. And at the same time, a lot of that same innovation might actually unlock more upside on the bottom too. We talk about like the growth of UGC and you know what the future of modding could look like. And I think that even if the door for competing for these billion dollar games, that becomes a lot harder to compete with. At the same time, we're still going to see a lot of interesting activity and growth on the other side of the spectrum with, you know, platforms like Roblox, with Fortnite creative mode, leveraging Unreal and whatever else is to come. And I think back to a conversation I had with um, Scott Rice Manis, who's the founder and CEO of Mod.io. And one interesting thing he said to me just regarding indie developers was that a lot of the the indie developers that we've seen over the past decade, before that, uh, many of them were focused on on modding. Like they wanted to build on the platforms and games that they love most, but because of the business model and model and culture around modding that didn't really provide financial incentive, it wasn't possible. And we've seen the pendulum swing to greater indie development. And I think too, we'll, we've seen like rising like venture investments to support, you know, bigger teams with bigger budgets from from the ground up, which is worth noting. But if uh, we enter an era again, where more building on platforms and modding on great games in more ways becomes more viable, you could even see a pendulum swing back to some degree of a lot of like the like indie talent that wants to build that kind of game not even necessarily build their own game, but just build on back on top of the great platforms and IPs that they previously loved and that, you know, or the new IPs that are being built. So I don't think innovation is dead at all. Definitely the dynamics are shifting, but we're on a trajectory to still have bigger and better games and more games made by more people. And on both sides of that spectrum, the opportunity is growing. So I think we have a lot to look forward to in the future. Do you think that opportunity is there? That's like a really good, I just say that this topic could probably have like an entire podcast just talking about it all in, in its thing. And it'd be curious also to get Jonathan and Devin's opinion on this too. I, I in general, I, I think I agree with you, but maybe with, with one caveat, which is like the commercial opportunity. And what I mean by that is that something that was kind of common again, back in sort of PS2 era is you had the concept, I guess, of like the B game from a B studio, right? So that's not kind of like, you know, your shovelware that you'd find. And if you remember, you'd have like these sort of you know nintendo wii games that clearly cost like fifty thousand dollars to make but could still turn a profit but they were clearly not competing with activision with rockstar you know they were sort of in between and this is sort of where you you did see like innovation and you saw studios trying to make a name for themselves and some of those studios would become a and triple a developers after that but they would have this kind of like semi-title that they put out first and that in my opinion is just not possible on console right now. Definitely not, right? Maybe you get it from indie games, but the difference is, is that if you're an indie developer and you make a breakout hit, like a Hollow Knight or something like that, is the upside there for you? Because in the past, what would happen is that that success could then turn you into a Blizzard, you know, who started off with Lost Vikings, and then you become like this huge gargantuan entity. Whereas I feel like that's not really true at the moment. And so that's why... I think I agree with you. You're going to get bigger and better, more badass games. You're going to have more opportunity. It's going to make it more efficient for people to make. But will people get a fair slice of the pie or will they forever be kind of stuck in this sort of area? And that's something that does concern me as somebody who's been in gaming for a while. I think it depends how you define B, right? Because what I was going to add in here is, you know, to Aaron's, and I'm going to go back to, I think the answer is all of the above, right? I think like, the, I think, you know, like Call of Duty is going to be more people plus AI, right? And for somebody at the end of the spectrum, it's going to be AI instead of people. I think what we have to be mindful of is what I'm going to call the Batgirl effect. And what I mean by that is, you know, when Warner Discovery killed Batgirl because it wasn't a billion dollar franchise, it was maybe only a $250 million franchise, right? Like, I think the hard thing is going to be anything that can't make a B at Activision, at EA, you know, at Take Two gets killed. Right. So they only play at a B plus. And I think there will be a thriving Web3 indie ecosystem. 
and even like call me crazy when Aaron was talking about sort of like, you know, the rise of sort of the re-rise of the indie thing. I might even think there's an opportunity to be anti AI, which is like at, at the, at a certain level of indie, like this is humanly crafted, right. And to use that as a marketing position, right. Like this is a, this is a crafted game, right. This is the equivalent of the $500 hoodie of games. Right. And I think there might be an opportunity even for that, but I think that like how you would traditionally define a B might be might be the victim here, right? Might be the thing that gets sacrificed. I'm not I'm honestly not convinced. And I think that what we might see is that it's the it's the Activisions and EAs of the world that lean away from that B tier. But w- at least what I see like on like the venture side is that there's more money than ever um like being raised and flowing to Um, like startup game devs who a lot of times like have experience like building these these big um, IPs and are being given more money (laughs) than ever before at earlier stages to create what might kind of replace like the the B games coming from like these massive publishers are just going to come more from from the startups who raised more money I don't know if that's going to completely replace it if it's really the best comparison or not, but I—I I mean, I still see um, people potentially tackling that opportunity. But yeah, it will be exciting to see where all this trends, where all these trends go in the future. But yeah, it seems like to me there still is opportunity in more places than than not, and talented people can fit in to different parts of that value chain in new and interesting ways. Definitely, a topic I think we'll have to revisit, uh, especially since you know money is going to continue to be. You know, something we we talk about here with games and uh, budgets and who knows, maybe the next Call of Duty will be a huge flop. and We'll be talking about this, you know, conversation from a different angle. But uh, a lot of great stuff being said. Everyone got their kind of a blog rant in there. So that was great. Uh, but <laughs> I want to thank you all for being here. Always a great conversation with all of you. And it was great to, to have the first one with you as well, Jonathan. Um, I want to remind Thank everyone you. again about the mailbag as well, uh, podcast at novic.co. Make sure to, to, to get your stuff in there. We want to make sure we have more than enough of your guys' topics and, and feedback and stuff like that to talk about as well uh, to add that in. But thanks again for everyone as well for tuning in and we'll catch you guys next week. If you enjoyed today's episode, whether on YouTube or your favorite podcast app, make sure to like, subscribe, comment, or give a five-star review. And if you want to reach out or provide feedback, shoot us a note at podcast at novic.co or find us on Twitter and LinkedIn. Plus, if you want to learn more about what Novic has to offer, make sure to check out our website, www.novic.co. There, you can sign up for the number one games industry newsletter, Novic Digest, level up your insights with our premium research platform, Novic Pro, or contact us to learn about our wide-ranging consulting and advisory services. Again, that is www.novic.co. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you in the next episode.